morning, everyone. I'm Tony Macaron with the City Manager's Office. Welcome to the Helen Drake Senior Center for our budget hearing. First point of business, I wanted to introduce our interpreter today. Sandra, if you can please introduce yourself. Thanks very much, Sandra. This morning's budget hearing is hosted by Councilwoman Thelda Williams and Councilwoman Vanya Guevara. And at this time, I'll turn it over to them for some opening comments. Good morning, buenos dias. Uh, welcome to the Helen Drake Senior Center in District 5, um, co-hosted by my colleague, Councilwoman Williams. We're very excited you're with us this morning to hear from you about um, our proposed budget. Uh, we also have city staff in the room if you have any questions that you would like to have addressed immediately. And uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Although she claims it, I get to share it. District 1 shares the, the Helen Drake Center also. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. This is your opportunity uh, to tell us what you like or don't like or what you think is missing in the budget. And believe it or not, we really listen. Changes get made based on this public hearing. So if you haven't filled out a card, please do. We encourage you to tell us uh, what you're thinking, what you think we need, and what your priorities are. Thank you. So we'll start this morning with a short video that gives you an overview of our budget for 2019-2020 and then leave time for questions after that. Thanks very much. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20 proposed by the City Manager for public review and comment. The City budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the city prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent. Three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services. And $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Jomax Road in North Phoenix. 
the creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit, and in the police department, de-escalation training and community response services support for officer-involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's traumatic incident intervention resources ad hoc committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident-Based Reporting System and second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness, in human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library. Technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right of way for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. 
strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. Okay, with that, I think we'll begin. If you do have a card, just make sure you fill it out. And I also wanted uh, to acknowledge that we have Mayor Gallego's office uh, also represented in the room. Thank you for being here. If we could have uh, Pearl. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. Is Pearl here? Okay, did you have something to say? Did you want to speak? Okay, come on. You can come on up. Up here to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Members of the City Budget Budgetary Committee, thank you for funding our senior centers. Thank you very much. I see the head of our site council over there, Jennifer. Good morning to you, too. She's an excellent resource, excellent resource. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. A couple of comments and a question, if I may. Would you please consider keeping our libraries open every day? We thank you for Sundays, but would you please consider every day? They're a very valuable, valuable resource, very valuable resource. Another comment, if I may. I come to Helen Drake Senior Center here. We have exercise programs that are video-led and instructor-led. The exercise program that I speak of you, that I speak to you of now is instructor-led. It's our chair yoga program, led by Patricia Levy. Every so often during the year, she takes two weeks off and goes to another center because she cannot come here because she says the city of Phoenix cannot afford to pay her. Knowing that this is not the end of a fiscal year, I know it's not a fiscal year issue. My question, will you please consider funding her for the two weeks that she has not been able to come here, okay? That's all I have to say, again, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
The next speaker is Donna Miner. Good morning. I'm Donna Reiner, and while I live in District 4, I always enjoy coming to meetings at this site because it is quite lovely. And I can take public transportation here, too. So this is my third budget hearing speaking, and this is my first time in front of Councilwoman Williams and Councilwoman Guevara. I am representing the Friends of Phoenix Public Art, which is a nonprofit organization. We've been in existence for approximately three and a half years. And Councilwoman Williams said, if we saw anything that was glaringly missing, and besides having libraries open every day, I agree, one glaring missing thing is funds for the capital improvement maintenance of public art. We have $100,000 in the budget, but that barely covers the infrastructure, which public art is those. So if you are going on some of those beautifully designed uh, pedestrian walkways, those are public art. And if they're not maintained, and we all know what happened with Burton Bar when we didn't maintain properly, <coughs> um, we're gonna have some huge issues. Public art is like any capital project. It has to be maintained or this investment goes down the tubes. And we have one of the best public art programs in the nation. In fact, there are even people from foreign countries who come to find out how we do our public art. And so we need to continue to have that commitment. And I am hoping that you will have the wisdom and compassion to make sure that Phoenix is a better place for all of its residents and give at least 25,000, that's a minimum, just 25,000 more for that budget fund. I would like a heck of a lot more, but I'm not gonna be greedy. Thank you, Donna. Up next we have Sue Soto. Good morning, thank you for this opportunity. I will be speaking about library hours and I will make it more brief since it seems to be a popular item today. My name is Sue Soto and I'm a longtime volunteer at Choya Library in District 1. I also serve as president of the Friends of the Phoenix Public Library. The Friends raise funds each year to pay for hundreds of library programs and services at every library branch in the city. Thank you for including additional funds in the trial budget to, in District 1, open Agave Library on Sundays. However, our system-wide library hours still remain lower than they were 10 years ago and lower than other major library systems similar to Phoenix. Unfortunately, in District 1, Agave Library will still be closed on Mondays and Choya Library will also be closed on Fridays. In District 5, Yucca Library will remain closed every Monday, and Palo Verde Library will remain closed every Friday. In fact, over half of the city libraries will still be closed on Mondays or Fridays. These closures represent a significant lost opportunity. In 2018, the Friends of the Phoenix Public Library provided over $207,000 in direct library support. This year, the Friends are the primary funder for the summer reading programs at all 17 library locations. The Friends fund free programs and services to thousands of library users each year, but we cannot do so if the library is closed. We ask that you work with us to open every library every day. Our private dollars can support programs and services if public dollars can keep the buildings open. Thank you for the additional funds this year, and we look forward to seeing our libraries open at the levels from 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Carolina Cornell. I probably mispronounced your last name. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Carolina Coronel, and I'm here representing Garfield Organization, a neighborhood alliance formed by Garfield residents such as myself, with the sole interest of fostering a strong sense of, sense of community to create a safer and more beautiful and a more connected neighborhood. Now, let me tell you why I'm here today. In 2008, the City of Phoenix commissioned a preliminary roadway and drainage analysis for 13th Street from Moreland to Van Buren Streets to improve drainage conditions. The intent was to develop alternatives for the installation of curbs, gutters, and asphalt along 13th Street. 11 years later, nothing has changed. Still, there are no curbs and gutters. So every time it rains in the valley, especially in this area, 13th Street and the cross streets along the approximately one mile stretch between Moreland to Van Buren become water pools. Residents frequently deal with flooding as rainwater covers sidewalks, enters their homes, and I mean the front yards, and many times they enter their homes. This happens at every monsoon season. Soon after the rain stops, but before drying out, residents deal with not only standing murky water, but mold and all the debris. When the rain, rain water dries, most of 13th Street is filled with clouds of dust. This brings yet another issue to the residents. Those residents seeking to park next to their own homes along the side of the road on 13th Street have been ticketed by the City of Phoenix Police Department for parking on non-dust proofed surfaces. Now let me ask you, where else would and could we, the residents, park if not in front of our own homes? Clearly these residents, including myself, find um, themselves in this catch-22 situation that without a doubt would not be tolerated in most other communities. Moreover, Garfield Elementary School is located in the southeast corner of 13th Street and Roosevelt, and it has its main entrance along 13th Street. All children attending Garfield Elementary walk through, walk through um, clouds of dust, flooding rainwater, and other debris on a regular basis. And for those of you who are unaware where this um, area is located, 13th Street, Garfield is all, um, it's within the Garfield neighborhood. Garfield is also recognized as a historic neighborhood adjacent to other historic neighborhoods in the heart of downtown Phoenix. A long overdue solution has been sought out by the Garfield residents for decades. Garfield has been a neighborhood initiative area for the city of Phoenix since the 1990s. Throughout the years, Garfield residents have been requesting help from their city representatives and other city of, city of Phoenix officials, but nothing has happened. I wish I was here asking for a specific amount, but what we really need is to the, the study we have been promised to be completed. I am here to ask you for that to happen and the amount required, including the amount required to fix 13th Street to appear on the preliminary budget by the time we have these hearings next year, if this cannot happen this year, by the way. For your help and support, will, your help and support will allow us residents have homes free of dust and flooding water throughout the year. Thank you very much. And um, we have some of the pictures, um, well, I, have, I brought some of the pictures here, so I'm gonna walk by and if you wanna see them, I'll be standing in the back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. Um, next we have Jeff Spellman. Good morning, Councilwoman Guevara and Councilwoman Williams. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Jeff Spellman. Uh, I represent the Violence Impact Project Coalition. The VIP Coalition uh, got its start right here in the Helen Drake Center a number of years ago. I think it had to be about 19 or 2016, something like that. And uh, that was an effort that the city actually started to address crime and blight, drug dealing, prostitution, all along the 27th Avenue corridor. The city worked really hard on that project for about a year, and we got a lot of improvements over that. A lot of uh, crime rooted out, a lot of drug houses rooted out, things like that. 
At the end of the, end of the year, uh, the big thing that came out of that meeting that was still a problem and impact for us was uh, the homeless. And we talked about that at the end. And even though uh, that formal VIP project was ending, the city asked the community to pick that up and keep going with it. And so we did. We spent quite a bit of time uh, organizing all of the neighborhood leaders in the VIP area, which covers Dunlap to Indian School, 19th Avenue to 35th Avenue. It's a huge area. In the process of getting organized and talking and having uh, community meetings and workshops to figure out what our priorities were, we decided that we would first start working on 27th Avenue itself so that we could try to get the most impact for the effort that we were doing. So we're actually pretty close in finalizing that plan for the VIP coalition, a plan that uh, looks more strategically at redevelopment, revitalization, beautification along the 27th Avenue corridor, uh, taking old blighted buildings and uh, doing something new with them. Uh, one that you'll probably know and relate to around here is the Kmart building, the now vacant Kmart building. We are working vigorously to try to get something special in that facility that will serve our community better. Uh, we were very close, we thought, to getting a WinCo there, and we're going back to them with some, hopefully, some additional ideas that might lure them back in. Or at the very least, maybe another large grocery store uh, or other large employment center. But also, we're looking at and talking about uh, additional community resources in there, like job training, perhaps some element of housing, things like that. The reason I tell that story, some of you attended those meetings here for over a year, um, is that we still struggle. We still struggle with the impacts of the homeless in this area. And it's very, very challenging to try to convince investors to come into an area when it is significantly impacted and blighted with those things that come from homeless, criminal transients, drug dealing, needles, prostitution, all of those things. And the prostitution has had an uptick again along 27th Avenue. We are seeing it in our face. We're seeing it in the parking lot right here at the Helen Drake Center. So um, kind of a story to kind of lead into the things that I support in the budget and the VIP coalition. Uh, there's three proposal supplements of the general fund that I think will help to mitigate neg negative impacts. Uh, you started on those last year. Uh, through the budget hearing process last year, we talked about the problems and the challenges of getting homeless encampments cleaned up. There really was nobody assigned in the city to do that. They were just trying to do that as part of their regular services. So what you did was you added a couple of temporary crews, one in solid waste and one in the streets department to do homeless encampment cleanups. And I can tell you that that aspect probably has helped. At least there's quicker response to getting encampments cleaned up, the trash and so forth that is led, uh, left behind. We still have a problem with getting those people addressed and the help that they need and getting them off the street. I have a lot of problems and challenges with the way that uh, Phoenix Cares works or in my mind doesn't work very well. Um, but the bottom line is those cleanup crews do help. And so this year you've got a couple of proposals in there to make those um, crews permanent in the regular budget. And so I would like to see those done. They do help us mitigate some of those problems in, in the neighborhoods. The third package that uh, is proposed is to add nine park rangers to the program. And uh, I can tell you our parks are significantly impacted uh, with the problems with homeless transients hanging out there. And uh, the park rangers are doing a very, very good job in helping to mitigate those problems. And they're still doing it consistently with how the city wants it done. Lead with services, but don't allow the negative illegal behaviors to happen in the parks. And I know that they are working um, the way I'd like to see the outreach teams work better, which is in conjunction with the CBI outreach teams, the police department, and the rangers. So they're still going in, making sure that people have the opportunity to get the help if they want the help. But if they don't want the help, they don't allow the behavior to continue, and they stop that negative behavior right now, not six or eight or 10 contacts from now, which is the way CBI works. Um, so anyway, I think that's a great program. The park rangers are in our flatland parks. I think we're seeing a lot of effect from that. And the new, the new package uh, proposes that uh, there be nine more rangers, which will give us seven day a week coverage 
from 4.30 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, and that's fantastic. I think that will help a lot in our parks and get our parks back to the people that need to use the parks. It's not a thing against people hanging out in the parks, even if they are homeless. It's fine. I see people hanging out in the parks. If they're not doing anything wrong, they can be there just like anybody else can be there. But if they're doing illegal things, and when I talk to the rangers, what do you see? You pick up a blanket, check on somebody's welfare, and what do they see going on underneath that blanket? Somebody smoking meth, somebody shooting heroin. Lots of times, lots of times they see that. So I realize that maybe some of these things aren't high priority for the police department. They've got other pressing issues, but the rangers are focused on our parks, and those are quality of life issues. We need our parks to be clean and safe so that we can use them. So I really support that, that package. My last point is a question that I have, and I'm looking for information. Last year, um, I spoke about the um, uh, Phoenix Cares and the CBI outreach teams. I think the city's funding somewhere in around a million dollars a year for that program. And I had done some research on it, and part of that program, they were supposed to be putting 15% of the people they contact into housing. And I got the statistics on that last year, and uh, I found that they were only performing at 10% of that, so they weren't even meeting their contractual requirements. And I guess for that level of performance, they were rewarded with another half a million dollars last year to add more outreach teams with the idea that they would then go from 10% to 30% of the people being contacted being moved into housing. My question, request for information, is how can I find out what those performance levels are now this year that they've gotten an additional almost half a million dollars added to the budget from last year? So that's in the regular uh, budget, which would continue. It's not a supplemental, it's in the, in the continuing budget. So if somebody can get me information on that, I would really like to know how that's performing. My hope is that it's much better than it was last year, but what I see on the street is it does, it's not really working very well. So. Those are my quest and support for those three budget packages. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you and I have had several conversations about this in the last year. And one of the challenges we have, I can't speak for the whole city, but I can speak for west of I-17, clear to Happy Valley Road, is we do have a very transient population. I take them out of the homeless category because they refuse services. And they're the ones that cause us the most problem and challenge the police and the park rangers all the time. The homeless, true homeless, will accept services. The transients will not. And one of the problems I think you will find that they've ran into is when you first start, you think everybody, they'll be so thankful, you're going to get them a home. And you find out that's not the case at all. It's a preferred lifestyle. And I think that's one of the challenges that they have had in meeting their goal is they were stunned when they first found out, no, I don't want a house. I don't want to go in your program. No, I won't go to a shelter, et cetera, et cetera. So we continue to work on that. I think one of the things you saw was two case managers in here because one of the things I've learned in the last six months, uh, it's great when you can get a homeless person into a house, but your challenges don't stop there. <laughs> because if they've been without funds or they've been without a home, uh, and all at once they have some funds available, granted it's very small and it usually only pays for the very basics, their housing, whatever, uh, but they have a tendency to just go go forth and so they need someone who can help them prepare a budget stay within the budget take their meds pay their bills on time etc and that's what those case managers are for so slowly i think we're tackling the problem it's just a huge problem but when you look at other large cities we're so much better off and i think a lot of it's because we have a lot of concerned citizens that stay involved i know that um the neighborhoods watch make sure that uh, the alleys are staying as free as possible. Um, and I know our police department, Cactus Park Precinct, has just been overwhelmed but has done a tremendous job in going out and dealing with these people. But I, I hear you, and it's something we need to work on. So thank you for bringing it up. Thank you, Thelda. I, really, I think you hit the nail on the head. 
It's the difference between, I mean, even those transients, they probably need the services. They weren't ready to accept the services. So we need a little bigger hammer type of a thing that would coordinate those efforts that would kind of force them, force their hand. It just can't continue to stay in the neighborhoods and impact us the way it is. But the things that you're talking about is exactly right. I'm not about just trying to chase it out of my neighborhood because that's one of the things we're talking about at that Kmart property is the possibility of having some sort of uh, permanent supportive housing there, which that's what people need. If you can get them into it, they need all those wraparound services that will help them change their circle of friends, get their lives back in order, more than just put them in a home or buy them a meal. So yeah, I think yeah. you're exactly right on that. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and one other thing that, I'm sorry to monopolize <laughs> this, but uh, we're working with the courts to see if there's a way that uh, if they uh, have a repeat offense, that we can mandate that they go into some type of service for a certain length of time so that perhaps we can change their mind and their lifestyle, but that's... Mesa's doing that, and they're getting about 30% out of it. So I applaud you. If you can get the courts to do that, and the police put them there and, and document that, that is a good step in the right direction. Thank We're you. We're working on it. Awesome. Thank you. The next person is Patrick Murphy. Thank you very much, Council Members Williams and Guevara. And I want to thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Patrick Murphy. I'm a member of the Arts and Culture Commission for the City of Phoenix. We truly appreciate the level of support in the trial budget. We are incredibly thankful for the $25,000 increase over last year's grants budget to invest in our communities and youth, and also for the $100,000 allocated for public arts and maintenance. The support that you give to the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture makes cultural services available to Phoenix residents for all ages. Our award-winning public arts program focuses on our neighborhoods, making them a safer and making our city more vibrant. Maintenance for this program is a significant need for all of our communities so that arts installments, which are many times tied to improvements in street, transit, and other necessary services, remain safe and showcases our city to its best. The arts helps to maintain a healthy and cultural workforce and assists in making Phoenix a great place to work and visit. We appreciate these modest increases and support to the Arts Grants program since the recession. And with these funds, we're able to make Phoenix a vibrant hub for creative industries. But other cities of similar population grants programs are double what our program is, with our closest competitor having a grant-making budget of $1.7 million. Long term, we would like the city to consider moving in the direction of $1 per capita spending on arts and culture grants funding. Phoenix is an amazing city to be proud of, and we have some incredible, innovative things that are happening. But to truly recruit and retain business, arts and culture, along with education, play a huge role. We know that you recognize the importance of this, and it shows in the positive changes that have occurred to this year's budget. We urge the city to keep moving in the positive direction in the coming of years. Thank you very much. That's all the cards we have. Does anybody else want to speak? Oh, come on. I know some of you aren't shy. Good. Well, we have one volunteer, and I see a couple others pointing at each other, so come on up. If you just give us your name and address for the record, please. My name is, oh, and sorry, I sound like a frog, but it's not me. Um, my name is Shirley Diekman, and I live at 4832 North 32nd Avenue, right across from, I call it the big place, called Grand Canyon University. <laughs> um, I just, sat there and, re and thought, wow, the libraries, okay, I have 
a son and daughter-in-law that both work for the library. My son started working about two years ago, and he was so overwhelmed with what he could do in the Akutia Library, helping people find jobs. And he, it is, it's one of the best places. The whole community uses it. This is right at Central and Southern. And so keeping them open longer is the best thing you can do, and every day would be wonderful. Um, they have just, he, I, he so embraced it because he said the kit people would come back and say, thank you for helping me do my resume. Thank you for helping me find a job. Thank you. So now he's going back to school to get his library science degree so he can be an actual librarian. So it's a win-win it's a for me, but it's also for you guys because there are tremendous things happening at the library. And I, the Friends of the Public Library are tremendously helpful and great people. And I'm, I, was, I didn't realize how much they helped the library, so I'll have to get involved there. Um, the other one, my, uh, my daughter-in-law works at the Burton Bar Library, so she found out what it was like to work at a small library. Quite a process, I'll tell you. And the security guards that are offered, that's a tremendous idea. She's faced some interesting situations in the Burton Bar Library, so the extra security guards in, is a real plus, too. So I'm, I'm all for that. So I hope it becomes really a permanent part of the um, budget, and maybe next year we can add full-time. The next thing that the public uses a lot is the park. I live just north of Salido Park. Just last year, they gave us 11 park rangers. You can tell the difference on those land. Oh my gosh, it's, it's fabulous. The, the park does have people, like they say, that are there, but um, the park rangers are able, there's more park rangers keeping an eye on them. You see more families coming in. You see more people wanting to go to the park. There's just, you don't see a, a trail of, of uh, shopping carts. Um, so it's just been, it's just tremendous. And so more park rangers, you can't go wrong there. That's absolutely a fabulous thing too, and I hope it stays in the budget. Um, and a park manager, those are all wonderful, positive things that I'd like to speak for. The library, the parks, that gets people involved in Phoenix, and that gives us a way of contacting them to get them involved in their neighborhood. Um, one of the other things that arts and culture, well, not only do my kids work for the library, but they also work for the art museum. So, and they've used the arts and culture to um, do a couple of, uh, uh, my son has a degree in the performing arts, so he's quite animated. If he were up here, you'd be going, oh my gosh. Um, but he involves high school kids, and that's what you want to do is you want to start with the kids. When you've got the library open in the summer for the reading program, okay, you've got the kids there. That's what we need to do is make sure those generations behind us are finding the positive things to do instead of the negative. And so when you open the parks and you have park programs that bring in the teens, and then you also have um, an arts program where they can get involved if they're interested in drama or music. So I'm all for all of that. And yes, the arts and culture does probably need a, And I know a lot of us think, oh, artsy, fartsy. I mean, I have said that myself. But the arts are really something that enhances your feeling of positive. We did a mural on um, out by Alhambra High School last year, and I can't tell you how much it's made the kids feel empowered. It's, they're the Alhambra Lions, it's a fierce line, and it's saying we're here to make things better. And a lot of the kids came out and helped us, and the other thing is, is those kids also come out and help clean up alleys. They have a whole group that will come from Alhambra High School. So those are the things you wanna do, is you wanna say, buy into the neighborhood, buy through arts and culture, buy through the park, buy into the neighborhood, so I'm all for, those are very positive things. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I just wanna thank you all for coming and especially for your comments and there are more hearings coming up and you are invited to participate in those. If you think of something new, I think you can go online, make a call, or attend another meeting, and be sure and share it with all of us. It's important. 
Thank you again. And if you're not comfortable coming up uh, and speaking before a large group of crowd, a large crowd, please feel free to come up to us individually if you're more comfortable. Did you have a question? Okay. Just please state your name and your address for the record. Thank you. Good morning. How are you this morning? Oh, I didn't see that one hiding back here. Our assistant chief. Hi. Um, I'm Frank Steinmetz. I'm with the Cactus Wren Neighborhood Block Watch. A lot of you have put up with me in the past. Uh, I'm also with uh, Cactus uh, Wren Neighborhood Block Watch, uh, Phoenix Neighborhood Patrol, and currently with the uh, Phoenix uh, Citizens uh, Academy. Um, a while back, we had a new chief who came on board and uh, made a very tough decision, and that was to go and get more officers on the street, which we need. And in doing so, they had to go and change positions of the uh, neighborhood patrol coordinators, the multi-housing officers. Where we're at, we have some multi-housing units. These units have become a nightmare since the uh, multi-housing officers have been taken off the streets or put on the streets versus being able to work with multi-housing units. I would highly recommend that our dear beloved chief and everybody else try to do something to get the multi-housing officers back on the jobs that they have. Our CAOs don't have the specialty training. They're doing a fantastic job with this in their job description. Uh, I know in talking with several people that the specialty officers will not be reassigned until we reach the 3,200 officers that we need. Assistant Chief, I wish you could help us get some multi-housing officers back on the job. We need them badly up in our area especially. And you know, we attended a couple other meetings recently. Uh, Parks and Recreation had a um, outreach for community uh, leaders. And it was amazing. They said the same thing. They're having problems with multi-housing units. So it's not just a unique position for us. Uh, it's a problem that we have citywide. Maybe get two or three that they can jump back and forth. Just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you all once again for being here.